The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, good morning, members, and also uh, the commissioner and all the other uh, folks who are gathered in the room. Uh, this subcommittee uh, is called to order now for the purposes of here of an oversight hearing on current issues and a vision for the future for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, and I welcome everyone to this hearing. Uh, the chair now, without any uh, other delays, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of our opening statement. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was one of the premier accomplishments of the 110th Congress. The law created basic safety standards for keeping toxic lead and phthalates out of children's products. It gave the Consumer Product Safety Commission vital new resources and authority and established a product testing system that would ensure product safety. I would like to welcome Chairman Inez Tenenbaum, who is the ninth chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. She hails from the great state of South Carolina. Chairman Tenenbaum is nationally known as an advocate for children and families. She served with distinction as the state of South Carolina's superintendent of education for two terms. I'm looking forward to, hear, uh, to seeing uh, and hearing from Chairman Tenenbaum as she steers the process of implementing the CPSIA. Under her leadership, I believe the implementation will go far more smoother than under uh, the previous chairman and that the CPSC will work effectively uh, utilizing the increased resources that are now at its disposal. This is why I'm so pleased to welcome Chairman Tenenbaum today and to hear from her about the Commission's new direction and its future vision. It is mentionable that the Chairman uh, now has a full complement of commissioners, something which it lacked for far too long under the previous administration. I think that the president has chosen well in nominating Robert S. Adler and Ann Northrup as commissioner. Commissioner Adler has a deep history of experience as a former legislator, a former advisor to two CPSC commissioners, Commissioners Pittle and Savora. And Commissioner Northam is a former congresswoman from Kentucky's third district and a mother of six who served for nine years in the House of Representatives. As a congresswoman, Commissioner Northam founded the House Reading Caucus and co-chaired the Congressional Coalition on Adoption, which further shows her own personal commitment to helping and defending children. Madam Chair, when you took the helm, you showed great courage, sound judgment, and a preference for rulemaking over 11th hour slaves. One of the first agenda, agenda items that you scheduled was whether to exclude crystal and glass beads in children's jewelry from the lead content restrictions in Section 101A of the CPSIA. You applied the facts as you found them to the CPSI's lead limits and to the real world facts and foreseeable possibilities. For example, you taught and <clears throat> talk and wrote about how children handle and play with this jury by mouthing, ingesting, and swallowing the beads, and how any amount of lead 
constituted too much lead in these beads. Your willingness to grapple with thorny issues and convince some of our Pacific Rim trading partners who today manufacture as much as 85% of our toys, 95% of our fireworks, and almost 60% of our electrical products shows your leadership and your vision. Unfortunately, more than 85% of our country's recall products are also imported. Chairman Tenenbaum, I will ask you questions this morning based on remarks you have made in your public statements on some substantive areas that pose special safety and recall challenges and how you would go about implementing the CPSIA. I'm also very interested in hearing how you see the CPIA transitioning from the North area to Tenenbaum time uh, with a shiny new product safety, uh, product testing facility with more employees and more appropriated dollars. And as I close, I want you to comment as extensively as you can about the CPSC's timelines for adopting new rules under the CPSIA. About some of the things that the GIO, uh, G, I'm sorry, GAO advised us um, and other improvements that you uh, will make at the agency. I look forward to hearing your testimony, and I thank you again for visiting with us today. Uh, and uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Redonovich, for five minutes. I thank you, uh, Chairman Rush, for calling this important hearing today. The CPSC is a small but important agency whose mission is implementing and enforcing our nation's federal consumer protection safety laws. The Commission and its staff work hard to ensure consumer products are safer when they reach the homes of our constituents. We all remember the increase in Commission-mandated recalls in 2007. Weekly headlines detailed various toy dangers, most of which were due to manufacturers' fa failure to comply with existing standards, for instance, lead paint. To their credit, Commission staff was, was able to affect more recalls in 2007 than in any other year in the CPSC history. Despite the Commission's diligence, some observers claimed the increase in recalls was evidence that reform was necessary and spurred the enactment of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, also known as CIPSIA. CIPSIA instituted the most sweeping changes to the Commission's regulatory environment since it was created. Among the changes, the law imposes many new requirements on businesses in the name of providing greater assurances that consumer products reaching our ports and placed on our store shelves are safer. While no one disagrees with, the, with creating safer, pro, safer products and, it, and it's good for public policy, we don't all agree on how to get there. The law has had consequences detrimental to many hardworking Americans. Put simply, the law is not working the way that many of us thought that it should work. In April, hundreds of business owners that want to abide by the law came to Washington and voiced their concerns. The new law is crippling many honest businesses, particularly small businesses, with burdensome and costly testing requirements for children's products, many of which the evidence shows are completely safe. Despite the Commission's stay of enforcement for testing, many manufacturers are still being required to prove that their products are CIPSIA compliant. As a result, testing for perfectly safe products is costing businesses millions of dollars. Inventory losses for safe but technically non-compliant products is estimated in the billions, and there is no discernible improvement in child safety. Many small and uh, home-based businesses are already hurting from the economic recession. On top of the de decrease in consumer spending, manufacturers and real re retailers are now faced with the new cost of complying with the CIPSIA and if, if they can comply at all. Many of these same small and medium-sized businesses will also suffer punitive effects of the cap-and-trade legislation passed by the House and the health care legislation this committee reported out last month. We committed nearly a trillion dollars in stimulus spending for various industries, bailed out the auto industry, bailed out financial firms, bailed out homeowners, and helped purchase new cars for some consumers, but where is the relief for small businesses whom we now burden with this regulation. 
these small businesses are beginning to think that Congress is waging war against them. Providing sensible regulatory relief to those affected by SIPSIA would be a no-cost stimulus for the very businesses we are counting on to create new jobs and bring us out of an economic recession, and it's the right thing to do. The biggest problem with SIPSIA I see is that it doesn't distinguish between risky and safe products. The law strips the Commission of discretion in granting SIPSIA exemptions for children's products. The Commission confirmed this interpretation of the law when it voted to deny exemption petitions because the law simply does not permit exemptions if any lead can possibly be absorbed, even if the staff believes the products are not harmful. This standard is more stringent than the FDA's limits for milk and for water, the water our children drink. But the law is not only impacting businesses, it's also straining the Commission's resources as they process the thousands of comments, petitions, rulemakings, and other SIPSIA related actions. The Commission has done its best when it can the Commission has done the best it can with the resources that, that the appropriators granted to increase its staff in order to meet the stringent deadlines required by law, but it has not received everything we authorized and therefore needs relief from these tight timelines. I commend the Commission for finding creative ways to provide some relief to businesses with a few common sense exemptions and stays of enforcement. Unfortunately, some of these actions are only temporary, and they don't address the bulk of the problems. But the highlight of the recognition that compliance with the law as written is impossible for many businesses that it won't and it won't improve safety. I'm disappointed that we will not hear from any witnesses from the many businesses adversely affected by the new law, but I look forward to a robust conversation with the new chairman on these matters. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your desire to conduct this oversight hearing into the Commission's priorities under a new administration. It's clear that the top priority for all of us should be to fix the law that we wrote so that it works for everybody. A one-size-fits-all approach is not working and will not improve safety. The time has come for us to work together and fix the problem by restoring flexibility for the Commission to determine what presents a real risk to children's safety and appropriately uh, target those risks. And I stand ready to work with you on this, Mr. Chairman, and welcome Chairman uh, Tenenbaum to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes for purposes of opening statement. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important oversight hearing, and I want to welcome Chairman Tenenbaum to this uh, hearing today as well. Uh, last year, Congress enacted the truly historic legislation uh, on uh, product safety. Our product safety system, and especially our toy safety system, was terribly broken. We saw record recalls and a total loss of consumer confidence in the safety of products, and children were killed and horribly injured by defective and dangerous products, and the stories were shocking. The situation was unacceptable to the American people, and Congress responded. Following a lengthy and careful process, we enacted legislation that's strong, well-designed, and effective. The law bans lead in children's product, a step that is decades overdue. There's no safe level of lead and no reason that children should be exposed to lead in their toys. The law establishes a safety net for product safety that many consumers already assumed was in place. For the first time under this law, manufacturers need to demonstrate that products are safe before they can be sold. The law bans phthalates in certain children's products and recognizing science that shows these chemicals to be dangerous, especially to the youngest and most vulnerable children. And finally, the law addresses systemic problems at CPSC. We provide them with stronger legal authorities to carry out their mission and additional funding for the agency. And we restore the commission to its full size of five commissioners. This is a key step that enables the commission to carry out its critical mission after years of neglect and dysfunction. So in short, the law is a good, strong, one, and it vastly improves our children's health and safety. Now that we're a year away from the recalls and the most dramatic stories have left the front pages, some suggest that we don't really need such a strong law. But the fact remains that the system we had in place was a failure. This law was necessary. To retreat now from the proven consumer protections achieved under this law would be a huge mistake. There is no question, however, that implementation has at times been uneven. 
Since the law went into effect, there has been unnecessary and widespread confusion among businesses and consumers. And I'm committed to working with the Commission and with interested members of Congress, and to you particularly, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that moving forward, implementation of the law is clear and comprehensible. And that's why I'm very pleased that uh, Ms. Tannenbaum is here. We'll uh, hear from her about her plans for the Commission and for the law. I have great confidence in the Chairman, together with the other four Commissioners, that they will restore the agency to one capable of carrying out this law and its entire mission effectively and efficiently. I look forward to hearing the Chairman's testimony, and I look forward to engaging in a productive relationship with leadership that is truly committed to protecting all consumers, especially our children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairwoman, for being here. Um, I voted for the bill last year. I was on the conference committee along with Chairman Waxman and Mr. Dingle and Mrs. Schakowsky and others. Um, so I'm a supporter of the bill. Having said that, um, I listened with some uh, astonishment to what our distinguished chairman, Mr. Waxman, just said. Uh, I interpret what he said to mean that it's just a problem of implementation. It's not a problem of implementation. As you have said, Madam Chairwoman, the law doesn't give you the flexibility to do some of the things that uh, you have been encouraged to do to implement the law. We need to change the law. We need to perfect it. We need to modify it. We need to, uh, to give some flexibility and some discretion to your agency to implement this law. Uh, myself and uh, <coughs> Mr. Radonovich and others uh, have repeatedly asked Chairman Waxman uh, to, uh, to hold a, a markup of, or to work with us on a bipartisan basis to come up with a, uh, a bill <clears throat> to fine tune the law that we passed last year. Um, we, st we started making those requests informally in January. Today is, is a hearing, which is a good step, but that's all this is, is a hearing. Uh, we need to do more, in my opinion, then hold a hearing. I've got right here, I'd say that's uh, 200 letters, maybe 150 of uh, small businesses around this country that have written uh, to myself and to the chairman and other members of the committee uh, to do something to, uh, to fine tune the law. Uh, Mr. Radonovich is gonna ask unanimous consent at some point in time to put those letters in the, in the hearing record. We have products before us. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dress that's in front of uh, Mr. Radonovich uh, can't be tested because if you test it, it destroys it. Uh, these products uh, are gonna be pulled off the shelves because the cost of the test is more than the, uh, the value of the products that are sold. Uh, there should be some common sense implementation, some common sense refining. We're not trying to change the lead standard. We're not trying to uh, to backpedal on, on the intent of the law, but uh, when you can't sell an all-terrain vehicle because of concern that a child is going to ingest a tailpipe or something like that, uh, there needs to be some discretion given to the, uh, to the regulatory agency to use a common sense approach to uh, implementing the regulations. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm glad that you're holding this hearing. I'm gonna submit my formal statement for the record. Um, I hope it doesn't, I know you're a White Sox fan, uh, and not a Cubs fan, but I hope it doesn't take the Cubs winning a pennant before we decide to act to change this bill. Uh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Cubs yeah, we, you know, we need, the good news is that what needs to be done is not that difficult and that it can be done on a bipartisan basis and it can be moved out of committee and it can be moved through the House and the other body and the president signed in the next two to three months. I mean, this is not a huge mountain that we're trying to overcome and there's not, if we get past the insistence that it's 
a perfect bill and, and, and it's like the Ten Commandments, you can't change a, 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 a letter in the, any of the Ten Commandments, uh, we can get this done. And I hope that's what this hearing is about, is finding a way to get it done. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chair, I want to thank the uh, ranking member. I want to assure the ranking member that uh, we will get something done before the Aggies win the DCS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's dead for that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> the chair now recognizes the uh, chairman emeritus of the full committee, my friend from Michigan, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding today's hearing. It is an important one. I would like to extend my warm regards and welcome to Chairman Tenenbaum. I'd like to thank her for appearing before us today to discuss issues facing her agency, and her vision of the agency's future. I want to make it very clear, Mr. Chairman, this hearing is needed. It is oversight in the way that it should be conducted. And again, I commend you for it. A long time ago, a dear friend of mine by the name of John Moss, then a member of this committee, and I, in this room, held a series of hearings which led to the enactment of legislation creating the consumer product safety, of which he and I and other members were co-sponsors. Last year, my dear friend, the ranking Republican member of this committee and I got together with other members of this committee, including you, Mr. Chairman, all in a sense of concern about the fact that the Consumer Product Safety Commission was not able to do its job because of budget cuts, personnel cuts, demoralization, the inadequacy of resources and personnel to do its job. And from that came the Successor Act to the original Consumer Product Safety Act, which was passed in 72, and which returned it somewhat, and the Commission somewhat, to the state that it had had at the time that we offered the first legislation. Now, I want to make it very clear. As the original author, or the remaining original author, of the Consumer Product Safety Act, and the author of last year's legislation, I feel very strongly about the needs for strong protection for the nation's consumers. And I feel very keenly that the Consumer Product Safety Commission has not been able to do its job because of a deregulatory attitude and a skimpy attitude with regard to funding of the nation's regulatory agencies. And so, with my colleagues on this committee, I wholeheartedly supported a restoration of a good regulatory framework to ensure the safety of consumer products distributed in commerce in the United States particularly those meant for use by children. And that is a feeling which I shared with my colleagues on this committee. And we tried to see to it, not only did they get the authorities and use the authorities which they had at the CPSC, but also that they got the resources which had been permitted to shrivel in a most lamentable fashion, indeed, to laughable proportions compared with those of other federal regulatory agencies, so that the agency was in, in effect completely neutral and incapable of doing its business. But we thought we had corrected that. And I would note that until recently, CPSC might well have been described as a moribund agency, hampered by inadequate funding and all too limited statutory mandates. For these reasons, we did what we did in terms of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, CPSIA, which I have alluded to earlier, which was ultimately signed into law by President Bush last August. CPSIA is meant to bolster the agency and to enhance its authorities in order to improve CPSC's ability to carry out its fundamental purpose. Again, the protection of consumer health and safety. It should be noted, though, that a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Our dear colleagues on the other end of the building, 
called the United States Senate, got into the act, and with profound ignorance of the way the law worked or the intention of this committee and the authors of the legislation, proceeded to do extensive redrafting and have created difficulties which we were unable to cure in the conference between the House and the Senate. We had abundant outside assistance which confused the issues further from consumer representatives and enthusiasts who did not know how government works or how government should work. And we had considerable messing around from both the Senate and from this body, which has created confusions which remain today. Now, I remain concerned about the difficulties that have been encountered in the implementation of the CPSIA as improved by the United States Senate. I would remind all present that that legislation passed this committee unanimously in a bipartisan fashion. And again, I commend my friend, the ranking minority member, for his leadership in this matter and his cooperation and assistance. And it passed the House unanimously. And then it came back from the Senate, and all of a sudden we had a lot of negative votes because people were honestly concerned about the confusion that had been inflicted by the United States Senate through its own amendment process and through the process which we saw take place in the conference. In any event, there appear now to be problems, and I'm hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that we will be able through this process to ferret them out and to correct them and indeed to find out what they might be and how they're impacting upon the American people, upon consumers, and upon businesses. In January, on the 30th, uh, in a letter to the committee, former CPSC Chairman Nord wrote, the timelines in the law are proving to be unrealistic, which in fact they are. And then in brackets, CPSC will not be able to continue at this pace without real risk of promulgating regulations that have not been thoroughly considered. Moreover, Chairman Nord stated, although CPSC staff has been directed to move as quickly as possible to complete its work, short-circuiting the rulemaking process gives short shrift to the analytical discipline contemplated by the statute. In brief, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairman, I intend to use my time today to discuss with you whether you share this view and more specifically whether you believe that CPSIA contains realistic deadlines for rulemakings and compliance as well as too little implementation discretion to CPSC. That these problems have triggered a number of meetings between members of the House and Senate in which it was discussed that perhaps maybe the House and the Senate should pressure CPSC to come to conclusions which may or may not be supported by the law. And I wish to state with great clarity that it is not my intention to undo anything that has been achieved via CPSIA, but rather to discover what action by this committee, as a part of its oversight, may be necessary to correct any shortcomings that have been inflicted on the law and on the people of the United States by the actions of our dear friends in the Senate, who have confused in a splendid fashion an otherwise excellent statute. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Chairman, for coming before the committee today. And I look forward to a frank and productive discussion about the matters currently confronting the CPSC, as well as the future of the agency, in the hope that perhaps our current efforts may achieve, without the assistance of our dear friends and colleagues in the Senate, the kind of confusion that has been inflicted upon your agency in the time since we passed CPSIA. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chair thanks uh, the uh, Chairman Emeritus, 
Now the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for two minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Thank you, Chairman, for uh, having this hearing today. I also was a conferee on this legislation that met with the Senate uh, to adopt this uh, legislation, and it passed overwhelmingly in the House and, and also in this committee, as Chairman, former Chairman Dingell said. I think we also have a responsibility to protect our children, and this legislation does precisely that, but it also has had unintended consequences. And uh, m many members have already discussed that today. The timelines are in question. The exemption authority that was taken away really from the uh, Consumer Protection Commission. Uh, the sad thing is now the, the standard is so strict that the CPSC does not have the flexibility to exempt seemingly obvious products that do not contain a lead or other chemically hazardous materials. And so we have a lot of small business people today spending thousands of dollars to prove that their product is safe, knowing full well that it is safe. And so it seems to me that it's not right that Congress passes a law so stringent that the commission with the authority to enforce these laws does not have any flexibility. And I think we have an obligation to the people of the United States, particularly at this time of an economic downturn, that we do not want to make it more difficult for small business people to stay in business. And we need to do everything that we can do to correct the problems that are in the legislation that was passed overwhelmingly by the House and Senate. Now you'll back the balance of my time. The Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes my friend, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, the gentleman lady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for two minutes. Hi, thank you, uh, Chairman Rush, and I want to welcome Chairman Tenenbaum. Uh, we had the pleasure of meeting each other recently. I appreciate very much your reaching out to, uh, to me and uh, hearing about your commitment to make the Consumer Product Safety Commission an agency that will truly live up to its, uh, its name. And I look forward to, to working with you. I, I, too, wanted to talk about the uh, Com Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. Um, there were many, many important provisions in the bill, which I think everybody would agree to. Um, some that I um, worked on, including mandatory infant and toddler durable product standards and testing and the Danny Kaiser Child Product Safety Notification Act and the first mandatory safety standards for children's toys are going to help grandmothers like me feel confident when I buy supplies or gifts for my grandkids that those things are going to be safe. And I know that there have been implementation, uh, problems with implementation of the, the new law, particularly under the previous leadership at the CPSC. Um, I personally think that the, uh, the, the law can be successfully implemented. I just wanted to point out some flexibility that I do see in the, in the law. The, the law includes language that empowers the CPSC to exempt certain materials from the testing and certification requirements and to relieve those manufacturers of products that are in no danger of violating the new standards. And I know that the CPS has begun to apply some of those exclusions. And, and so I think there are opportunities within the e existing bill to deal with complications. For, for example, I know that the CPSC has exempted from the lead testing requirements components that can't be accessed by a child, components of electronics devices inside uh, uh, intended for for children, a stay of enforcement of a lead and phthalates testing rules for, for a year. So uh, a number of things ha have been done. Um, and I think we should first, before we change the law, look at those and see if they can provide the kind of relief to um, issues that have been raised today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The chair, <coughs> thanks, gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Ms. Dr. He's down here. Uh, the chair recognizes now the the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for two minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Vidanovich for having this hearing, and I'd like to congratulate Chairwoman Tenenbaum on her confirmation and welcome her before our subcommittee. 
The Consumer Product Safety Commission has a very important job. It protects consumers and families from products that may pose hazard or injure children. We must ensure that the CPSC effectively carries out this mission and has the tools to do so. Yes. As the father of two young children, I want to be assured that the CPSC does its job and that the toys all children are playing with are safe. One particular issue before the CPSC that has affected my district, as well as many across this country, is Chinese drywall. After Florida, Louisiana has had the most cases in the nation of toxic drywall. The Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals has received over 800 complaints about Chinese drywall, and it is estimated that the amount of Chinese drywall brought into Louisiana after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita could potentially affect approximately 7,000 homes. My office has received numerous complaints from constituents affected by Chinese drywall. One man who called lost his home to Hurricane Katrina and had to relocate his family to another town, only to find out that the home he moved into was built with Chinese drywall. Another constituent realized he had Chinese drywall in his home when his wife, who was four months pregnant, wasn't gaining any weight. Her doctor told her to move out of the home, and now she and her husband are living in separate towns while their home is repaired. During these tough economic times, many of our constituents cannot afford to purchase another home or rent a second one while repairs are being made. It is clear that Chinese drywall is wreaking havoc in homes, charring electrical wires, corroding metal, and causing serious health problems. We must determine the origin and scope of the toxic drywall, and we must take action against those who introduce the drywall into American markets. It is also important that we continue testing in order to realize the potential health problems that Chinese drywall can cause. Chairwoman Tenenbaum, in your testimony, you mentioned that the CPSC is committed to finding answers and solutions for all the homeowners impacted by this issue. I want to know what those answers are and solutions you have found. The citizens of Louisiana and elsewhere in the country who have been impacted by Chinese drywall deserve clear answers and solutions. Those affected in my state have already been through so much, and now four years after Katrina, many once again have to rebuild their homes. This is unacceptable, and we must ensure that no one has to encounter these problems in the future. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield back. The chair uh, recognizes now the gentleman from Texas. The gentleman, uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for uh, two minutes for the purpose of opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, very much for calling this important oversight hearing of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, welcome to Chairman Tannenbaum. Uh, I'm pleased that we have this opportunity to discuss the Consumer Product uh, Safety Improvement Act with you. You have outstanding experience, and um, your background as a teacher and the state school superintendent for the, for the state of South Carolina uh, demonstrates uh, your commitment to families and consumer issues, and you're off to a great start. Um, and in many ways, <clears throat> this is going to be, uh, this hearing is going to be very different than if we had uh, proceeded with the one scheduled a few months ago. Uh, at that time, many concerns were expressed to me about the CPSIA implementation, many of them stemming from the lack of information and what to expect from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Rumors were flying that uh, children's bookstores would be forced to close or thrift stores would not be able to sell toys at all. But under your leadership, in the last few months, many of these concerns have been addressed, and I thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that the assignment that was given to the Consumer Product Safety Commission was not an easy one. The new Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was a fundamental shift from a reactive product safety regime to a proactive approach. Uh, before, parents just had to hope that toys they were buying for their kids were safe and watch for product recalls. And all too often, the prevailing consumer product, the consumer safety policy with regard to toys was caveat emptor. This resulted in a disastrous 2007 uh, Christmas shopping season when popular toy trains uh, had friendly, inviting <coughs> faces painted on them with Chinese lead paint. And one popular toy called Aqua Dots allowed children to arrange brightly colored beads into designs and then bind them together with water. Unfortunately, the beads gave off the so-called uh, uh, the drug GHB when swallowed. So Congress gave the CPSC a big responsibility last year, and there have been some bumps in the road. Uh, for too long, there's been a lack of guidance from the agency for retailers and manufacturers, and some of the deadlines for guidance came and went without the required guidance. 
but I'm extremely encouraged by the actions taken by the Commission in recent months. Uh, the quality and, qu and quantity of the proposed rules that have come out uh, just since your swearing in is truly encouraging. Uh, and like my colleague from Louisiana, I do hope you will address an important Florida issue, uh, important to, to many other states, and that's the Chinese, unsafe Chinese drywall that's used, has been used in the construction of homes. It's making many families in Florida sick. Uh, families should not have to worry that the building materials in their walls emit corrosive, toxic gases into their homes. So I look, uh, look forward to hearing more from you about what the Commission is doing about toxic drywall and what we can do to help on that issue. Uh, thank you for being here. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. The Chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing on the issues and the future of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I think we all agree that protecting consumers, especially children, from unsafe products is a worthy goal of government regulation. In 2008, the House of Representatives passed the Consumer Pro Product Safety Improvement Act with the goal of improving the safety of products that children and parents use every day. However, the implementation of this law has given many cause for concern. We have observed a number of unforeseen and negative consequences arise and that are now putting undue pressure on businesses and manufacturers here in the United States. These consequences are increasingly problematic, especially during tough economic times when we desperately need the jobs provided by businesses and manufacturers. I received countless emails and phone calls and letters from businesses expressing the difficult and damaging effects this law is having on them. The CPSC needs the proper resources and the time and the flexibility to carry out the implementation of this law in a reasonable and thoughtful manner. I have grandchildren and I want to be sure their toys are safe. I don't want to weaken laws that ensure the products on the market are safe for all consumers but we need to do this in a way that is realistic, clear, and fair. And that is why I've joined many of my colleagues in co-sponsoring H.R. 1815. I believe this bill instituted, uh, institutes the needed flexibility the Commission needs in order to respond to the concerns of, of businesses and industry. I welcome Chairman Tenenbaum. I look forward to hearing your testimony and appreciate you coming here today and yield back. <clears throat> The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Tenenbaum, I think the most important um, component of your very impressive resume is your experience as an elementary school teacher. Because elementary school teachers use common sense in enforcing the law of their classroom every day. My mother's been teaching in Iowa for over 50 years, and at the age of 80, she's still subbing. So I have great respect for elementary school teachers. But I want to focus on a couple of things that have not really been discussed here this morning. And one is um, the point that you raised in your opening statement about the need for increased port monitoring. But underneath that, there's a subtext that we rarely talk about, and that's the incredible impact of foreign manufactured goods on the safety of consumers in this country. We've seen an incredible shift in consumer products that were manufactured in the United States that are now being made overseas. Most states have product liability laws that limit recovery in the chain of distribution to the manufacturer of those products if the manufacturer is subject to the jurisdiction of the courts and has not been declared insolvent. And anyone who ever tries to hold a Chinese manufacturer accountable to the jurisdiction of the courts in this state will tell you it is an immense challenge. In fact, many of these factories in China are de facto agents of the Chinese government, and so the whole concept of accountability in U.S. courts is an enormous impediment to consumer safety. That's why the role of your agency is so critical, and that's why the lack of enforcement on defective foreign products is one of the biggest challenges U.S. consumers face. So I applaud your efforts to focus on this we need to realize that many U.S. consumers are not being protected 
for the injuries and deaths caused by foreign manufactured products and come up with a joint strategy to address those concerns. On the issue of Chinese drywall, I inspected homes in Boynton Beach, Florida with defective Chinese drywall and came back here and was sick for the next six weeks. I saw with my own eyes the corrosive effect on metal that this drywall is having. I smelled the odors in these homes. It is an enormous crisis and it's just the tip of the iceberg of what's wrong with our import monitoring in this country. We have a lot to do to improve the enforcement of the quality of goods coming into this country and I pledge my commitment to work with you and your office to make sure that we're doing a better job of protecting U.S. consumers. And I yield back my time. Mr. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow, for, is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman. In the interest of Chairman Tannenbaum's time, I will refrain from offering a, an opening statement, but I cannot refrain from taking this opportunity uh, to personally welcome you and congratulate you upon your appointment. Our paths first met um, oh, five years ago when I was seeking election to the House and our guest today was seeking election to the other body. And all I can say is that the other body's great loss is the Consumer Product Safety Commission's great gain. You are certainly the best, one of the best things to have come from South Carolina in a long, long time. And on behalf of your kinfolk, on behalf of your kinfolk in Savannah, I personally congratulate you and welcome you to the committee and thank you for your service to our country. With that, I yield back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Sutton, for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, and thank you for holding today's uh, important hearing on the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I'm pleased to welcome you, uh, Chairman Tenenbaum. Congratulations on your confirmation. You have such an important role and responsibility as the head of the agency charged with protecting the public, um, especially children from unsafe and dangerous products. And, and uh, with your appointment, I'm starting to feel better already. So I wish you the best of luck. Consumer product safety is not an area that we can afford to ignore. And last year, I was proud when we passed the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. That law created basic safety standards for keeping toxic lead out of children's products. Manufacturers must affirmatively demonstrate that those products are safe. The Act also provides vital new resources and authority, including the Import Safety Initiative, which puts inspectors at key U.S. Imp key US ports. Because as we've heard here today, in recent years, the relationship, and I know you're well aware of this, the relationship between our nation's import safety crisis and our nation's trade policy has become painfully obvious. As imports continue to grow, 80% of all toys sold in the U.S. are imported from China alone, some manufacturers have shown a remarkable failure to adhere to basic safety standards. It's a national shame and embarrassment when companies and importers pay more attention to their costs than our safety and the safety of our children and, their fam and our families. Product safety must be the primary focus. In 2007 and 2008, more than 37 million toys were recalled in the U.S. This year, there have been 23 toy recalls issued affecting over 4 million toys, and every single recalled toy was manufactured in China. We have also seen reports of serious health problems in residents of homes containing imported Chinese drywall. And in response, I'm pleased that the CPSC uh, established a drywall task force working with other agencies to investigate the hazards of imported drywall. And I'm very interested to see the results of the task force studies and see what we can do to ensure that uh, things being imported into this country are safe for consumers in the United States. Go back. The chair uh, now recognizes the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Gett, for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to add my welcome to our new commissioner and say hallelujah, we're glad you're here. Um, I've, I've been uh, working on this legislation for a long time. I was on the conference committee uh, that after we passed the act to try to, to um, bring it to the floor. And, and I was really happy to work with my friends on the other side of the aisle, um, in particular Ranking Member Barton, to come up with these compromises. Um, what, I'm, what I'm now interested in 
is how the Consumer Product Safety Commission is going to implement these far-ranging uh, these far-ranging provisions of the legislation. Some issues have come up, as we're all well aware, since, since the enactment of the bill. And one of the things I'm interested to know, and I think Chairman Dingell and Chairman Waxman and others are interested as well, is can we, can we fix these issues administratively? Do we need to amend the bill? What do we need to do? In particular, um, ATVs and other, other uh, consumer products. I think, though, that the, the change that both the, the legislation and the new administration have brought to the agency are exciting. I think we're going to be able to do a lot for the consumers of America, and I'm really proud to be a part of this process. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. The Chair, thanks to the gentleman. It is now my pleasure and my privilege to uh, recognize the uh, chairman of the U.S. Uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, and to uh, extend to her uh, the customary five minutes for the purposes of opening statement. But prior to her opening statement, I would ask that she um, understand that it's now the practice of the subcommittee that you be sworn in uh, before you issue the opening statement. And so uh, would you stand and please raise your right hand, be solemnly. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, let the record reflect that the witness is uh, answered in the affirmative. Uh, her credentials has been uh, well established uh, earlier in this hearing, and now it is my pleasure to recognize you for five minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Good morning, uh, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member uh, Radanovich, and members of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. I am pleased to be here today to talk about the current actions that we are taking at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission to protect the safety of children and consumers, as well as give you my vision of this agency. Let me begin by saying that I'm deeply honored to have, been, to have the privilege of serving as chairman at such an important time in the Commission's history. Uh, in my first two months leading the CPSC, I have focused on three key goals, transparency and openness in, in those we serve, a renewed focus on education and advocacy for all Americans, but, and firm but fair enforcement of the product safety laws and regulations. My top priority since assuming the chair of the commission has been meeting the statutory deadlines for rules and reports required by the CPSIA. Through the hard work of the CPSC staff, and I must say I have never met more dedicated, hardworking people than those people who serve at the commission. I am pleased to announce that 12 substantive rules and policy guidance documents have been released since I was sworn in, in July, on June 23, 2009. In each of these proceedings, I have directed the Commission staff to work closely with all impacted stakeholders to ensure that the rules that we implement remain true to the statutory intent of the CPSIA, while minimizing undue burdens on small businesses and other stakeholders. As we move forward, I assure you that the sub assure this subcommittee that we will continue s to solicit feedback from all involved parties and work to implement common sense rules that are squarely focused on maximizing product safety and reducing administrative burdens. Another key priority of mine is the rebuilding and revitalization of the CPSC's internal business processes. The Commission's information technology systems are truly the lifeblood of this agency. Sadly, these systems were neglected for far too long. Early today, the Commission released a plan to Congress to outlining Phase 1 of our business process modernization initiative, which is the implementation of a searchable product information database. By leveraging technology, the CPSC can take a proactive approach to protect public health and safety and recognize emerging hazards more effectively. Consumer education is another key mission and component of, of my tenure at the, uh, at the agency. Through network television appearances and newspaper interviews, I have worked to reach millions of families with information about dangerous cribs, bassinets, and window blinds, products that have killed young children. Last month, the GAO released a report noting that the Commission could do a better job of reaching out to poor and minority communities that often do not receive critical consumer product safety information. And Chairman Rush, I know that this is a key priority of yours, and I want to assure you that it's also a key priority of mine. 
To that end, I have directed the Commission staff to expand our education and consumer outreach efforts to underserved Americans. Later this month, the CPSC also plans to launch a social networking, social engagement program that will establish the CPA's presence on various new media sites, including Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Through these efforts, we can educate a greater number of consumers and save lives. Increased oversight of the products coming through our ports is another key priority. The GAO recently released a study that audited and analyzed the agency's effort to police imports and prevent the uns uh, entry of unsafe products into the U.S. market. I agree with all of these recommendations, and I've directed the Commission staff to update agreements with the Customs and Border Protection to allow but better information sharing. It is also critical for this agency to respond diligently to new and emerging product safety issues, such as problems now being reported with certain types of imported drywall. The CPSC is vigorously pursuing its investigation of imp imported drywall that has been linked to the corrosion of metal components and possible health impacts by homeowners in a number of states. And I understand the personal hardships that this issue has called impacted homeowners and want to assure the members of the subcommittee that effective and efficient completion of this investigation is a key priority of the CPSC and our federal and state uh, partners. Finally, I want to say a few words about the importance of pool and spa safety. Ensuring the compliance with the Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act is a critical priority of mine. I'm happy to share good news with the Congress today about what we found in the last few months. We have uh, sent our field investigators out to inspect over 1,200 pools and spas in 38 states as a part of a recently launched enforcement initiative. And we have found that 80 to 90 percent of the pools and spas inspected were found to be compliant. This is very good news and means that the children will be safer when they go sw swimming. We're also working with the state's attorneys general to find out why the other 10 percent are not in compliance. Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Rodanovich, thank you for again for allowing me the opportunity to update the subcommittee on my vision for the future of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I believe that CPSC stands for safety, especially the safety of children. So with your support, I intend to continue the transformation of this agency from what some have described as a teething tiger into the world's leading lion in consumer protection. Thank you. <coughs> the chair. I look forward to answering your questions. Okay. The chair thanks the uh, the chairman. Uh, before we engage in uh, the questions from the, the members of the subcommittee, the chair requests unanimous consent that uh, five uh, le that letters from five consumer groups uh, and uh, a letter from a uh, that was sent to me uh, on, uh, through the offices of common uh, congressman. Sh Shower of Michigan, that these letters uh, be entered into the record, and without any objections, you know, hearing no objections, uh, so ordered. Uh, you want to do the unanimous request at this time? Yeah, I, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple of unanimous consent requests. Uh, statements on on behalf of uh, Congressman Gingry and Burgess, and also letters from uh, constituents over a hundred here of. of Constituent companies, small businesses that are impacted by uh, the effects of the of this of SIPSI, of this legislation. I'd ask that all three of these items be uh, uh, accepted into the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, the chair recognizes himself for uh, five minutes for the purposes of questioning the witness. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, last year the CPSC requested. Uh, $80 million for FY209 as part of its performance budget uh, statement to the Congress. <coughs> and uh, that request was to have funded uh, 444 full-time employees, uh, which was which is an, incre an increase of 24 over the uh, full-time employee staffing level for 08. Uh, and my question is, how many of these additional employees uh, have been hired by the agency? Uh, do you see that these additional uh, employees uh, and any of those funds still going to going to CPSC's enhancements in import safety and product te testing 
capabilities. What proportion of the uh, FCs uh, and of your budget would go to each category? And <clears throat> what other roles do you anticipate that these uh, FCs uh, will play uh, under your administration? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, the CPSC has a staffing level of 530 uh, FTEs. We are currently uh, at 458 employees uh, at the agency. Uh, we have 18 pending hires that accepted offers for employment, and we are um, have 36 full-time employees that we have hired since January 2009. We have 29 vacancies uh, where interviews are currently underway, and 27 posi uh, other positions are in the stages of the recruitment process. We hope by uh, October to reach the ceiling of 530 employees so that we will be fully staffed. And uh, we will be putting additional staff uh, in port security and surveillance as well as uh, compliance and throughout the agency for, uh, to see that we uh, implement the CPSA, IA, and other statutes. I can give you the breakdown for every uh, division and how many will be um, uh, added to those divisions. I can send it over, but I did not bring it with me today. Yeah, uh, would you please uh, we are, supply, we supply are that to me? We will get that to you, but mm. we are hoping that by October we will meet the um, ceiling of 530, which is the maximum mm -hmm. FTEs that we are, are supposed to have. Uh, can you, uh, <coughs> the GAO's report on improving safety for minority children and families, uh, was, uh, as you indicated, was a major concern of mine. <coughs> And I know I, from your previous statements that you are, have committed to reversing or to improving uh, the, uh, the patterns of safety for uh, minority uh, children and families. Uh, can you expound a little bit more on some of your priorities in that particular area, please? Well, we found that overall the Commission um, needs to improve our ability to educate consumers. Uh, there's nothing more disheartening and sad that uh, find out that products that were recalled uh, several years ago are resulting in injury and deaths. And we have found that recently we have to go back and, and re-issue um, press releases, and we did this uh, recently on bassinets. But um, So that's why we want to step it up. We, we have a CPSC uh, 2.0 where we're going to be using new media, uh, as others are, to get the messages out. We also want to focus on, in the minority outreach, of looking um, at how we can enhance our um, our ability to t talk directly with minority organizations. Uh, we welcome the recommendation of the GAO, and the two things that the GAO, GAO found that we agree with is that we need better data on consumer products and minorities, and our data system is not uh, picking up uh, minority um, information that we hoped uh, we think we need to have. And the other thing is just the information efforts, not only to consumers as a whole, but targeting minorities. Uh, we believe that a child's economic background should not affect the risk of injury. Now, we will be leading a minority outreach day to increase awareness in product safeties in targeted markets, uh, that which will be a media event and, and working with organizations. And then we also work with the neighborhood safety uh, network members, and these are uh, several hundred organizations uh, where we can get information to them and they disseminate it to um, other minority um, organizations. Uh, we're going to report to you at the end of October on the GAO report, so we will address that in detail in our report to you in October. Uh, my time has expired. I want to thank you for your uh, responses to my question. The chair recognizes Mr. Um, Donovan uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, welcome Chairman Tenenbaum to the committee. And, and uh, I enjoyed uh, our getting a chance to know each other and, and uh, appreciate your outreach and, and welcome you to the uh, commission. I want to uh, just highlight a couple. We've got a couple of items in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the committee room here that kind of highlight some of the problems that Sipsia seems to have with small business. And, and uh, there's a couple of products over there that cost $65, a microscope of, for $60. And, and testing for those uh, products for the microscope is $3,678 for one, 24, that was for one of 24 samples that were submitted. 
and the other one was $5,973. But I think the item that represents problems with uh, small business the most is this Native American uh, ceremonial costume that uh, was created in the Southwest somewhere. We recently, my family and I came across the country, California to Washington, D.C., on a cross-country trip this August, and there were a lot of vendors at the reservations and such that were um, um, making a living by selling similar costumes like this. Many of these have beads or special designs that, that are, make them, each one of them individual. None of them are made the same. And uh, this poses a real problem because under Sipsia, this would have to be, one, one, one costume at a time would have to be tested and you'd be destroying the costume at the time that it needs, uh, that it's testing. So it's a, it's a really a small batch run product problem with Sipsia. And, uh, and I think this item highlights the problem the most. Now, products like this were, um, um, especially with crystal beads and such, that, that, uh, they, that folks had a problem with, and they submitted a request to exclude crystal and glass beads from the lead provisions in Sipsia, and, 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 and it was denied. And I, I want to read, uh, if I can, uh, your comment on the denial of the request. It said, in making a determination, I was mindful that the statute does not use the term harmful amount, which would allow staff to utilize a risk-based approach. Thus, while commission staff recognize that most crystal and glass beads do not appear to pose a serious, serious health risk to children, the request for the exclusion must be denied. So I, I guess my, I have a couple of questions um, that kind of revolve around this problem of small batch testing and the, uh, the uh, crystal and glass bead exclusion from the lead uh, provisions, do you think the Commission has the flexibility to exempt safe products that don't meet the exemption standard, or is it virtually impossible under the standard of any lead absorption for most products and materials? I appreciate um, your, your question. Uh, ranking Member Radonovich, because uh, I think there's been some interpretation of my comments that uh, have muddied the waters around this issue. So I appreciate the, the uh, opportunity to comment. Uh, you did uh, read a, the section of my comments that uh, have people wondering, uh, sh were the uh, crystals, uh, did they pose no hazard at all to uh, children? Uh, and, and I met with the staff yesterday to make sure that I understand, uh, mm -hmm. and it was really, I guess, poorly worded, that, fr that part of my statement. And what the staff meant when uh, they, uh, and I was taking it from their uh, memorandum, was that under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act, which was the old act, the act that, we, um, that we enforced and continued to, but before it was uh, amended by the CPSIA, the uh, CPSC had to determine whether a product can contain lead uh, and it resulted in substantial I illness or injury. So before you could uh, regulate the lead content, you had to prove that there was substantial illness or injury. When you passed the CPSIA, we were not required to prove that standard. In fact, Congress struggled over where to set the lead limits, and you determined that there was no safe level of lead uh, based on testimony, and uh, uh, you know, Congress did uh, which did not allow you to do any risk-based assessment well, of any of the products. Well, going right? back to yeah. the lead crystals, uh, Congress has set the threshold uh, after f October, I mean August the 14th of this year, to be 300 parts per million. Mm -hmm. These lead crystal beads were 900 parts per million, up to 23,000 parts per million per bead. So uh, I think it was poorly wor worded, but no well, one. Uh, but but during the conversation too, it was known that that these. Uh, the, the, that the lead in those beads were not in a form that was going to cause a problem even if they were ingested. And I think that that's, that's where the, the devil's in the detail of a lot of this. Some of those beads would have to be crushed up into powder and then swallowed in order to have the adverse effect of the lead, which makes me think that the Commission needs some type of, a, of some uh, ability to, to test things on a risk-based uh, uh, assessment and uh, what I, I guess what I think I'd like to get an answer from is do, do you think that products that are excluded such as crystal present an unreasonable risk of injury or are unsafe and do you need flexibility to grant permission exemptions to permit safe products that can't meet the statutory limit? 
Well, in the lead, uh, we showed that there was some leaching, but it did not rise to the level with one bead to oppose uh, to be listed under the Federal Hazardous uh, Substance Act. But then that but doesn't give you, but you don't have any flexibility to exempt that. what if the child swallowed 50 small beads? We could not determine whether or not uh, one, you know, one bead, it was uh, determined that we would not have put one bead on the Federal Hazardous Substance Act. But well, what if a child swallowed multiple you. beads and it would have raised the blood le le level? If, and, if, if, and if I may uh, get, get you to answer this one last question, though, do you need flexibility to grant uh, exemptions to permit safe products that can't meet this statutory limit? Well, it goes to the heart of the matter on what is a safe level for lead, and Congress struggles. But, but do you it. feel you need that flexibility so that you can I exempt feel like safe products? I it's premature for me to answer that question at this time because these beads went all the way up to 23,000 parts per million. Well, well let's just, in, in all products, do you need, in any case, do you feel that you need the flexibility to grant exemptions to safe, for safe products? I believe that we have to look at products on a case by case basis and with good science wedded with a good statute determine whether or not it's at risk for a, a the, the gentleman's a risk. Uh, time so I think it's premature for me to say when Congress struggled with this very issue, it was the heart of the CPSA lead limits, and they and Congress collectively decided and, and uh, overwhelmingly passed a statute that said we will have the um, any lead um, we will not allow a product that we're any even of those products. And, 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 and the, the chair has, has been very lenient with, <laughs> with the gentleman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That's the heart of the matter, right. really. Uh, the chair now recognizes the uh, chairman emeritus for five minutes for questioning the witness. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Uh, on March 4, 2009, I sent a letter to CPSC with 10 detailed questions concerning implementation of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, the CPSIA. I would uh, ask unanimous consent that that be inserted in the record at this time, Mr. Chairman. Hearing no objections, so ordered. At the request, rather at the instruction of former Chairman Nord, CPSC prepared responses to the questions which I ask, be, ask unanimous consent be inserted uh, into the record at this point. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Those responses indicated support for amendment of the statute, quote, in order to allow CPSC to set risk-based priorities given the finite resources available to it, close quote. I would appreciate now your candid responses to the following questions in order to ascertain whether you support such course of action or how we should address the problems that the commission has with the implementation of that statute. As my time is limited, Madam Chairman, I ask that you respond to these questions with a yes or no. I will note that I will submit these and other questions for the record in order to allow you to provide more detailed answer. First question, given widespread concern about the practicability of retroactively applying CPS uh, SIA's requirement to existing inventory, do you believe that the applicability of such requirements should instead be limited to products manufactured after the effective date of the statute, except in circumstances where the commission decides that the exposure to a product presents a health and safety risk to children, yes or no? Well, I would have to say no. The, the federal court decided that in the phthalate case that, uh, that we could not um, uh, exempt uh, products that were manufactured um, after the statute, before the statute was passed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Next question. I'm concerned that the age limit for children's products de defined in CPSIA unnecessarily subjects certain products such as bicycles or books or magazines to more rigorous standards than otherwise necessary. Do you believe the age limit used in the definition of children's products should be lowered to better reflect exposure? Yes or no? No, because you often have a home where multiple children are at all ages using the same product. Now, do you believe that CPSC should be given the discretion to set a further age, or rather set a higher age for certain materials or classes of products that pose a risk to older children or to younger ones in the same, house, in the same household, yes or no? I think I answered that in the number two, that we need to... Um, you mean the same no answer, Madam Chairman? Right, no. Thank you. 
I hope you understand this is not an attempt on my part to be discourteous, but I've got a lot to get in here, and I'm much concerned about the fact that time is running very fast. I'm also concerned that the blanket applicability to products of certification and tracking label requirements would be unduly cumbersome, both from the standpoint of CPSC and consumer product manufacturers. Should CPSC be allowed to address certification, tracking labels, and other issues on a product class or other logical basis using risk assessment methodologies to establish needs, priorities, and a phase-in schedule, yes or no? It depends on the individual product. You have to look at it product by product. Uh, I'm going to ask that you will have time to respond further to these questions, and I will be submitting additional questions to you as chairman of the commission. Do you believe the imp implementation of CPSI has overstretched CPSC staff and resources? Yes or no? It has, but they are hardworking, and um, our staff is working to midnight many nights. Many were at the 4th of July. They're working weekends to work out to get these uh, rules uh, finished. Madam so that Chairman, the, thank you. I've got a couple more questions here. Put differently, does CPSC have adequate resources with which to implement CPSIA as well as to carry out its other mandates? Yes. No. I'm sorry? No, we don't have adequate resources, but we're working okay. hard to do the best we can. If not, amount, if not, what amount of funding would you suggest be given to CPSC to allow it to perform its functions satisfactorily? Well, we are not, we've submitted our budget to OMB, and um, we cannot discuss it until uh, September the 14th, I understand, well, we, publicly. We do need the answer to that question if we're going to see to it that you can function. This committee has legislative jurisdiction over these matters, and OMB lacks that jurisdiction. And we, well, we can get it to you on September the 14th. Remember that difficult fact. Mm -hmm. So I'm requesting that you submit that to us for the record. Thank you. Madam Chairman, in conclusion, do you believe that the problems encountered in implementing CPSIA can be remedied solely via uh, administrative action by CPSC, yes or no? I would say most of them can by administrative Most. Action. So that means some cannot. There will be some uh, areas where we're st we still have not come up with I, a solution. We will, I will be asking further information so that you can identify that. Now, if not, do you support targeted amendments to CPSIA to address the concerns which have arisen during the Act's implementation? Yes or no? It's, pre too, it's premature for me to answer that. We okay. are working with all of the industries that are affected and trying to untangle the knots that they have with their products, and, and we're making great progress in resolving many of these issues administratively. And those that we can't, we will know in a short time. So you're telling me that such uh, cut-and-bite amendments carefully targeted to CP. SIA may be required. I said it's, pre too, it's premature for me to answer I that. I said when may. I didn't say will be. May be required. Okay. Uh, may. Now, if they are required, will you first tell the committee whether they're required or not? And second of all, uh, will you work with us if such are required? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Now, when will you know whether these uh, these uh, uh, these amendments carefully targeted will be required? Well, there is one rule that we are working on, and once it, it's called the, uh, it, it contains the component part testing rule, that many of these um, issues dealing with uh, handcrafters and uh, other products will be, will find out that under the component part, they will not have to test. Uh, for example, um, a shirt. A shirt it falls under the determinations rule. It's cotton, so you don't have to test a, a cotton shirt. But the buttons, if you have the button manufacturer certify to you that the button does not ca contain lead, then the whole product would not have to be tested. All right, let me let me and try and we feel like that's going to untangle a lot of have, the knots. You have problems in, in in involving a rule with regard to bicycles, off-road vehicles, and things of that kind, right? Well, I met recently. Just yes or no. Um, we are, uh, if you'll let me explain, on the ATVs, we no, met no, my, with the I'm, industry My time yesterday. is about gone, and the chairman is kindly permitting me to 
to there get, are issues to that we're working with administratively with both industries. Say it, it, have, again? it has a stay right now on both the bikes and the ATVs, and we're working okay. with them on how they can make the lead inaccessible in the parts that the rider comes in contact with, like the handlebars. You know, I looked at my bicycle. It has a rubber around it, so I don't come in contact with the So you've got a problem that you can't solve very quickly, can you? Uh, yes, we can once the uh, in excess, when, once we determine right. that they can make those parts inaccessible to now the you rider. Find, you've got a fine problem on motorcycles. Uh, motorcycles has has the issue of um, lead in the handlebars. It might and be lead in the vinyl seat, and, but and, a motorcycle and, might not be a ch children's product. And you've got a similar problem on all-terrain vehicles and snowmobiles and such? There are issues there in implementation, and we're working with the industry and met with and, them last week. And you've got a problem with regard to lead in publications, periodicals, books, children's and adults' books. Is that right? Well, uh, no, we don't. Uh, no, you this don't? is a book. Why is it that the Why is it that the book publishers are calling, telling me so? Because um, I, you know it'd be nice if uh, we could, and I want through um, offering to meet publicly with affected industries, which we are doing, holding public hearings, which I want to do, uh, we are resolving many of these issues. The ordinary book, like this book, will contain no lead. It's, pic it's pictures. It's printed with a four-color a process. This book complies. And the reason we have it covered is because... Uh, but you got books out there that do not comply. Is that right? The only books that don't comply are uh, books that are uh, published prior to 1985, which we don't consider a children's books. These are vintage books that uh, will um, be considered adult uh, vintage books, even if they're ch uh, for children. And those books, the only ones that don't well, comply, are those that have Madam illustrations Chairman, using my time is color. Now, now, the other thing about the books, um, what we've I got want you to d understand is that this committee wants to see to it that you have a statute that you can properly administer, without a lot of without a lot of toe dancing and improper and improper pressure being placed upon you to resolve questions in a way which are inconsistent with the statute. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to submit a further letter and information to the record and responses by the chairman uh, to get to the bottom of these questions that I'm trying to answer. Hearing no objections, so ordered, uh, and the chair wants the, the chairman emeritus to know that uh, you are in the thereabout. Uh, area of five minutes, so uh, well, uh, you have been excessively <laughs> and courteous. Well, <laughs> my respect and thanks. Well, that's because the chair has a deep seated love for the chairman. The chair now, for the chairman uh, emeritus, the chair now uh, recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, Madam Chair, on the question of Chinese drywall, uh, looking through your opening statements, uh, there are a few questions. One, uh, you had cited that your office has received 1,192 incident reports on this issue. Do you know how many of those are from Louisiana? Well, most of the uh, drywall problems are from Florida, Louisiana, and uh, Virginia. And so a great number of those are from um, Louisiana. Um, and we uh, realize that this is a serious problem for your constituents. And, of course, with all of the rebuilding that, that occurred after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, uh, our offices all throughout our delegation continue to receive more uh, complaints and serious problems. And I know some of my other colleagues from other states have expressed uh, similar things they're experiencing in their state, uh, but just because, I guess, of the high number of homes that have been rebuilt and, and obviously some of this toxic Chinese drywall was used in many of these homes. We can sit, continue to receive higher numbers. Uh, have you talked to our state's Department of Health and Hospitals uh, to see if, I don't know if maybe some people might have reported incidents to them that didn't find their way to your office to make sure that the numbers and the, uh, the incidents that have been reported are, are accurately being delivered over to your office within the state, in the cases where the state knows about an incident? We are working with our state partners, with our, your state health departments, and we're also working with our federal pro partners, the CDC, uh, HUD, EPA, and the White House Domestic Policy Council uh, to be uh, get as much information as possible. 
Okay, I understand your task force uh, on this issue is going to be issuing a report. It says sometime in the fall. Do you know roughly when that we report will be issued? Uh, we're trying to um, uh, issue this in late October, and the uh, report will have the EPA pilot study of six homes, the indoor test study, the EPA's elemental <coughs> analysis of drywall, which breaks down all the compounds in the drywall. We also have um, working on a phase two chamber test with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and a 50 home indoor air quality test program uh, that's conducted by a private uh, company, the Environmental Health and Engineering uh, um, Company. Is that report going to look into how, how this, this tainted drywall actually came into our country? What, what steps uh, were maybe, what things were missed that allowed it? Well, in. we sent a team over to China, and our team from the CPSC visited six mines and uh, received samples to come back, and we're using them uh, in, in the testing. Uh, we're tracking distribution of drywall in the United States, and what we've done is uh, written uh, letters to um, numerous uh, importers, builders, uh, companies that sell drywall. One of the issues that I have found is that the drywall uh, standards only address the um, structural integrity and did not address what goes in the, co the, the toxic compound. levels potentially. So that is one of the things that I want to do is is create a standard for drywall. So you we would have a universal standard of products that can go into drywall. And I'd look forward to working with you on that. And final question: You had mentioned in your testimony that over 500 consumers uh, were asked by your office to update their information on their incident reports. Uh, what what types of things did they, you know, was it that they maybe didn't fill out all the things you wanted or there was additional information you wanted? What what types of things did those... You mean on the drywall? Yeah. Uh, well, they just have uh, um, new information about how it's affecting them um, uh, physically. There, t there are two tracks in this. One is to look at is this dry, are these problems with the drywall causing these health problems, these respiratory problems, and then uh, is the drywall corroding... Uh, electrical wires and and so we're looking at that and they probably um, I can get you a, a, a summary of what uh, what the uh, complaints were or what the information sure was. appreciate that and uh, thank you mr. chairman for your latitude uh, the chair Go wants back. to announce that there are, uh, are votes on the uh, <coughs> on the occurring on the floor uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how much time is left but it's the chairman's intention to uh, to uh, uh, to, uh, to go and vote and to allow members to go and vote and then to return uh, for the uh, continu continuous of this hearing. Uh, so uh, we will be coming back, but the chair wants to recognize the gentle lady from Florida for her two minutes prior to us going to, to, to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll stick on tri Chinese drywall. Uh, and I appreciate the seriousness uh, with which the Consumer Product Safety Commission has undertaken uh, the investigation. And as you know, uh, importation of Chinese drywall spiked dramatically a few years ago. Uh, in 2005, we imported $3.6 billion worth. Uh, in 2006, that spiked to over $32 billion worth before dropping back down to $6 billion. When that kind of massive uh, spike occurs in trade for a product that could potentially cause problems, uh, does that raise a red flag for the CPSC uh, that maybe we should take a closer look? And ha during your investigation, have you considered an interim ban on Chinese drywall? And finally, there have been a number of proposals in the Congress, uh, and I'd ask you to please review those and and get back to us on what, what you recommend. Not, will you wait for the, uh, the results of the investigation? And, and tell me again what the, the time frame is for that. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for those questions. And we understand from Florida that you are getting many uh, constituent letters and that you're very concerned about uh, the quality of life for the people who live in your district. And we are, t too. We want you to, to know that. Uh, there are 6.9 million pieces of drywall imported from China. In, in 2006, there were. So 6.9 million pieces coming from all over the country. Uh, we have not been um, uh, from different sources uh, with different manufacturers, 
and um, which poses a, a different issue for the CPSC. It's not like you find one product that doesn't comply and can ban all products. There were some pieces of drywall from China that did comply and didn't have this problem. Other pieces uh, did. Uh, the report that we will give you in late October will be studies of the in-home, uh, the chamber test, as well as uh, we take the uh, drywall out of the home and, and take it to a chamber so we can uh, test the emissions from that drywall. There will be in-air quality uh, test, in-home uh, air quality test, and there will be elemental tests where the EPA is breaking down the elements to tell us what is in there that is causing uh, the corrosion and the respiratory problems. Uh, so we hope that this yields more information on the drywall. Uh, practically speaking, about a ban on drywall, it's very uh, the market has has taken care of that because very few people want Chinese drywall, and therefore we ver see very little coming into the country at this point. And so uh, that is where, but the overwhelming amount of drywall had been coming from China, and uh, now we're we get notification from the ports if if we if drywall is sent to the port, but very little is coming in at this time. We have met with our counterpart, the Chinese uh, a, uh, counterpart, AQSIQ. China has sent uh, experts in to, um, uh, to visit homes. They sent two of their uh, drywall experts uh, to, look, to go into these homes that were contaminated. As I said, we sent a team to China. Uh, Senator Bill Nelson from Florida went and met with the AQSIQ several weeks ago. He uh, told th them that uh, President Obama was going to uh, he hoped mentioned that when he met with uh, President Hu in uh, China, and so we, it's it's we are send, uh, really putting uh, a the great deal of our resources and attention on this, probably more than any other issue we're working on at this time, is focusing on drywall so that we can find an answer to it, and so uh, and after we find an answer, go on into rulemaking so that we can not have this situation uh, happen again. Uh, the committee uh, stands in recess, uh, and uh, there are approximately four votes on the floor, which are the final votes for the week. Uh, but we will uh, reconvene uh, 15 minutes after the last vote. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the chair really wants to thank uh, the, uh, the chair, the Chairman Tenenbaum, for her uh, thank you contributions <laughs> to this time. Thank you. So. The committee will again come to order. Uh, I, 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 w I want to again repeat uh, my uh, gratitude to you, Madam Chair, Chair Lady, uh, for your graciousness and for the uh, uh, the time that you are spending with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I don't see any other members here, so I'm going to recognize myself for one additional question, and uh, I think the ranking member have a, uh, one additional question, and then we'll, if we, if no other members, then we'll just adjourn and uh, be on our way. <coughs> Every year, for many years, we have seen numerous bills that uh, address specific product safety issues. These bills have continued to be introduced even after the passage of last year's product safety re reform. Just this year, there are bills in Congress to prevent stoves from tipping over unto children, to stop, stop the sale of dangerous toy cigarette light lighters, and even to address additional national health threats, such as uh, the uh, beforehand reported upon Chinese drywall. Now, the question is, why are we seeing these bills? What is the, why is the commission not addressing these issues as they arise under its own authority and on its own initiative? And the second question is, do you agree that the consistent introduction of these bills is evidence that the commission is is not fully and properly carrying out its mission? Um, and how do you see us moving forward? Is the, is these, the introduction of these bills, are they 
uh, any kind of indication of uh, of uh, of a, a need or a specific uh, focus of the commission, or is they, are they just members introducing bills? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, what you're asking me is, how can the CPSC be proactive in um, spotting hazards so that Congress does not have to introduce bills? And do we have the administrative uh, and regulatory uh, structure where we can handle them without legislation? Um, I appreciate this question because uh, it, it's a good one. Uh, first of all, as I have looked back in the history of the CPSC, the, the uh, leadership makes a tremendous difference because, you know, this, uh, this uh, commission relies on voluntary standards. And it's a question of when you see a voluntary standard not working to protect the health and safety of individuals, whether you move right in and go ahead and promulgate a mandatory rule. Uh, one of the things that I have observed as a chairman just for less than three months is that we need to review our existing emerging hazards and early war uh, warning identification system. And we really need to bolster this system with technology and resources. And our new technology database will give us more information than ever before so that uh, we can uh, spot these issues earlier. Uh, we need to initiate more investigations and increase our investigations, uh, be l much more uh, proactive about them. Uh, there are also uh, individual uh, scientific research organizations where if we had the resources, we could engage them or even they could use private resources to do analysis and testing if we ask them to. Uh, the, we have a deference toward voluntary standards. Uh, in fact, the law was passed in 1981 requiring deference to voluntary standards unless they are proved ineffective in addressing the hazards. I've already noticed uh, uh, in, in my short tenure that uh, there's one uh, particular product that I have seen that uh, there are no standards for, yet we've already determined 60 people have been killed on this, by this product, and there, we're going ahead and announcing, uh, um, announced uh, for a pup, um, notice of uh, rule, proposed rulemaking, ANPR, so that we will begin working on a standard and not just uh, wait until the industry comes up with a voluntary standard. So all of these... Um, are ways that the CPSC will be more proactive. And we also want to ha harness the new media opportunities that we have. Our new b brand is CPSC 2.0 with the blog, the Facebook, the uh, YouTube, Twitter, our recall widget, so consumers have up-to-date information. Uh, it's really uh, going to be interesting with the new uh, tech. We have the tracking labels, which... Uh, we went back to the statute and wrote a tracking label guidance, but industry is looking at a futuristic tracking label, label. So you could look at this barcode that would be universal throughout the world and pull it up on your, uh, say, your BlackBerry or, or, or iPhone and find out everything about this uh, product uh, right there in the store or, you know, when you, uh, by looking at the barcode. And so very few people are using it. It's, it's very futuristic. But that's the kind of technology that will enable us to be more proactive. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Mr. McDonough. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And um, uh, Madam Chair, I want to know what the purpose of a um, uh, testing and certification stay of enforcement is and what happens when the stay expires in February. Do you think that the commission will be ready to implement and enforce the laws as written? Um, thank you, um, Ranking Member Rodanovich. And um, first of all, the uh, we call that the 15-month rule, and mm -hmm. that we were required by statute to have that month, which will uh, that um, will be what is a reasonable testing, and it will have the component part testing in uh, in that rule, and it's due to be promulgated in November. Mm -hmm. And so under the statute, we will uh, be working, um, trying to get that out, because I guess what I wanted to say here this morning and what we prepared to try to leave uh, in your minds is that we are working hard to implement the CPS CPSA. We're finding out that with every rule that we put out, like the... Uh, determ lead determinations, uh, which probably would have exempted the blouse that you showed us from any testing, uh, the component testing, which will exempt so many products from the manufacturing having to retest again on, on items. All of these are helping us resolve a lot of these questions and to untie a lot of these knots. 
And so um, we will uh, be having that rule uh, shortly, and I think that it will help tremendously uh, with a lot of the complaints that you're receiving from industry. Do you think that you'll be able to implement and enforce the laws written by then in, G in February? Well, uh, we think that uh, after the stay of enforcement expires, we will have all the rules in place. And the stay was necessary, uh, the, the leadership at the Commission felt at that time, because there was so much rulemaking to do. We had not even approved all the third-party laboratories. The law says that manufacturers and private labelers have to have their children's products tested by a third-party laboratory. Right, right. And we had to approve all these laboratories, and, and so to date we've approved 190 laboratories in 27 countries. So now industry has a place to go to get their products tested. So we think that uh, when the stay expires that we'll have these uh, rules in place and that we c uh, will be able to untie a lot of these problems that industry has. That's why I said it was do, premature do you, to today. For forgive me, to though. I, I'm sorry. I just don't have enough I know, I'm time sorry, here. I your time. Uh, but, but do you think that uh, will you be able to grant exemptions under SIPSIA during, uh, uh, after that stay, or do you think that you'll have to to uh, post another stay, do you think we are hoping that we won't have to post another stay? If you do, isn't won't that be evidence of the need for statutory statutory change in SIPSIA in order for you to get all this done and be able to grant exemptions? Well, it, uh, we believe that if we, in good faith, implement all the regulations that uh, SIPSIA requires, that most of these issues can be resolved administratively. All right, thank you. Either thank you, Mr. through Chairman. not the product not containing lead or not being a product that will ever contain lead, like cotton or paper or certain kind of inks used in printing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> Madam Chairman, uh, we certainly appreciate, again, you, your time. Oh. Uh, just like, uh, we were joined, have been joined by uh, Mr. Sarbanes from... Maryland, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Sarbanes for two minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for holding this hearing. I want to welcome you, Ms. Tenenbaum, um, to your new role. And um, I'm very, very close friends with a fellow named Brad Parham from South Carolina, who I think you know. Um, and I look forward to getting to know you in your new in your new position. Um, I just wanted to uh, pass along a concern. Um, I have a number of uh, bulk vendors in, there's a number of bulk vendors in, in Maryland, and, and you're, I think, aware of this provision under SIPSIA Section 103A um, re regarding the tracking of, of products, and um, I guess they've expressed concern about that, that being impractical um, with respect to some of these smaller items that are come packaged in bulk and then are distrib distributed across the, the country to, to vending machines and so forth. And uh, to, the, to the Commission's credit and to your credit and, and, and evidence of you moving quickly in the job to try to address these areas of concern, uh, on July 20th um, there was a statement of policy issued uh, by your office that uh, for that certain category of products, 103, uh, by your interpretation would not apply. Um, and they've just expressed some concern I wanted to relay and get your comment on about the fact that uh, that doesn't necessarily prevent uh, action at the state level um, by state attorney generals uh, acting with respect to the statute, um, nor does it necessarily mean that uh, future commission uh, couldn't reverse its position on that, and I just wanted to get your perspective on on how this statement of policy you see working going forward. Well, this is a good example of us using common sense to enforce the law as our definition of tracking labels. Uh, the law requires uh, manufacturers of children's products to have a tracking label uh, to the extent practical on each product and the packaging. And so we've looked at, we've told the industry it's not one size fits all, that uh, you must be able to ascertain, and by ascertain, uh, you, you, we have to look at your product to see can we find uh, the name, location, uh, and date of production, and can we find who manufactured it and track it down if it need to be recalled. Regarding, so uh, we uh, got a great deal of praise from uh, a number of uh, industries because we used a common sense approach to the tracking label. Regarding the attorneys general, 
we have uh, have regular telephone conferences with them. I'll be speaking to the attorneys general. Uh, we want to uh, re enrich our relationships with them because we see th that the fact that this is such a small agency that we don't have the resources to enforce uh, all of the uh, consumer product safety laws without the assistance of our state partners, our local consumer product safety uh, commissions, the attorneys generals, and our local health departments. So uh, we don't have not found any cases where the attorneys generals have gotten out in front of enforcement. Uh, ahead of the CPSC, and we are encouraging them to let us get our rulemaking finished and work through a lot of these issues administratively. So we don't encourage them to bring uh, enforcement uh, injunctions because under the law, that's what the attorney generals can do. They they can seek injunctive relief. Uh, so I assume that your ongoing conversation, collaboration with them is is to is to uh, sort of cultivate this common sense approach at all levels. We are working with them, and uh, we certainly want everyone to have a common sense approach. We, we hope no one gets out in front of us before we get all the rules in place, which we hope will give relief to so many of these industries you're hearing from now. That is our goal, to protect the safety of children, to, to uh, pre, uh, keep intact the, the integrity of this statute, and to work out the best way we can these issues that you're hearing from, uh, from uh, industry. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Stupak for two minutes for the purposes of questioning the witness. The chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I was down in another hearing in telecommunications, so that's why I was not here. But I'm very interested, and congratulations on your appointment. Look forward to working with you, especially in my role as chairman of oversight and investigations. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act 2008. Um, and in my northern Michigan district, uh, ATVs and Motorcycles are a way of life for many of us and very important to our outdoor tourism and our economy. Um, in, in the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act 2008, purposely included a provision to regulate youth ATVs and motorcycles. However, it was an unintended consequence of the CPSIA that the equipment is also subject to provisions regulating the amount of lead contained in motorcycle and ATV parts. On April 3, 2009, the CPSC voted to delay enforcement of a lead ban on youth ATV and motorcycles for one year. It was not the intent of Congress to regulate lead content in youth ATV or motorcycles. So my question would be, does the Commission have reports of injury or death caused by lead poisoning stemming from the use of youth ATVs or motorcycles? Uh, we have over 900 deaths per year from ATVs, so the industry Correct, but I mean from has told me from lead. No, I don't nothing from lead. I okay. don't have any data on. Okay, that. is the commission testing the youth ATV or motorcycles to determine possible exposure to lead? We have just met with the ATV industry. The leaders of the industry came over and met with me last week, and th what they have reported to us is that they could make any lead that uh, would be uh, exposed to a rider inaccessible. They feel like they could make the handlebars inaccessible from lead by putting uh, covers on sure. them, handbrakes, and also the seat would not uh, would not contain lead. So they have uh, the state helped them uh, come up with this, and so that would uh, they're getting back with us to show us how they can do that, and then um, the uh, other parts of the, of the uh, ATV might be considered inaccessible depending on what technology they can provide to make the tire stem, the, the brass in it inaccessible, the battery cables inaccessible. Well, I understand all this inaccessible, so but... All out, so with, based on um, inaccessibility, uh, that really would solve the issue, we think. We're working with them to clear that up so that they won't have to... Um, well... Uh, I'm glad you're working with them, but if we have no death or injuries from lead exposure, why do we have to go through all these gyrations? Um, we have uh, isn't it your responsibility to make sure that the law is properly implemented, especially since the intent of Congress was not to ban these uh, we've vehicles? We've had plenty of cases of death to children from lead exposure and hand to mouth. But from ATVs and motorcycles. Well, a, a child could ingest lead, and that's what the statute right. requires yeah. is any lead. I, I, I agree, but with any law, there's a practical application, correct? 
no question about it and that's why the industry is coming back to us with practical solutions and we think this will take care of any problem they have and they won't have to be regulated all right okay. let me ask you about this one this is a recent GAO report August 2009 concluded that the CPSC presence at US ports is limited and in order to identify potentially unsafe products like drugs inferior steel from China it must work closely with US Customs and Border Patrol protection the report also found that CPSC's activities at U.S. ports could be strengthened by better targeting incoming shipments for inspection and by improving CPSC coordination with the Customs and Border Patrol. Um, as Chairman Oversight Investigation, I've spent a lot of years on this, especially a lot of years on this, especially drugs coming in from other countries, uh, not properly marked, handled properly, and we know that FDA's efforts are lacking in placing American lives at risk. But this GO report concluded that the FDA has more staff, has more surveillance technology, has more data on incoming shipments in our ports than CPSC, who also has the responsibilities. So this was not a good news report by the GAO. So are you developing any plan to coordinate your port surveillance with other agencies to improve CPSC surveillance at our ports? We are, and I reviewed the uh, report and uh, agree with um, those findings, and we'll be getting back with Congress uh, in October with our formal response to the report. But starting October 1st, as a result of that report, CPSC will have access to the Customs Import Safety uh, Center, which is called Commercial Targeting and Analysis Center. We will be able to place one full-time employee at that center to get information um, that we need in surveilling uh, in surveying um, the um, imports coming into the country. Okay. The, currently, Custom Border Patrol doesn't have any authority to deny shipments at a port, whether it's steel or whether it's drugs. That is, if a substandard shipment comes into the United States, uh, they may flag it, but they can't block it entrance into the United States. What does CPSC? intend to do to find a sub when he finds a substandard or hazardous product at a port right now we just stack them up in warehouses do you have any other we idea destroy them we destroy the um, the, the product uh, we have the authority to destroy it and customs has the authority to flag it they stopped um, several uh, products from coming in recently uh, so here is what uh, if you look at our uh, we have nine people in 300 ports and we also have field staff 100 field staff uh, but we have nine people at the ports uh, we, uh, this is a, a bigger area than just what the GAO re, uh, uh, reports because the FDA uh, is, requ you're required to send a manifest to the FDA Correct. 30 days ahead of time. We are only required to receive the um, third party testing results 24 hours ahead of time under the CPSIA. So this would be something that we need to have information earlier. Uh, we need through this manifest, uh, this uh, commercial targeting analysis system, that those are the manifest. And we, with uh, the proper technology, which we're submitting to Congress in our new technology plan, can look and, and, uh, and mine this data so we'll know what's coming into the port. And then if we find products that don't conform under the statute, the manufacturer or importer is required to take those products and remove them from the United States. If they don't have the funds and they have to post a bond, if they don't have the funds, we can destroy them. Uh, a lot of times we don't have the fun uh, amount of funds it requi requires to uh, destroy them, and we might uh, need to start increasing the bond to cover the cost uh, of destroying the product. But that's what we do with them. Okay. So this is new authority underneath the 2008 law then? No, we've always had the authority to, um, to stop. Uh, uh, well, no, this is new authority because the third-party right. uh, uh, laboratory certificate is uh, new under the CPSA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that concludes uh, the questioning of the witness, uh, and uh, the chair want to uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Redonovitz, who has a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I um, do have another unanimous consent request from one other member. However, I'd just like to make it a blanket unanimous uh, request consent that if um, other members wish to submit statements, they'd be allowed to do so. Right. Well, uh, the, uh, for the record, the uh, record will remain open for two weeks, and members may submit uh, questions uh, uh, to the witness uh, or any other um, 
documentation that they want to present to the committee. They may they have two weeks uh, from the day uh, today's date in order to uh, submit those questions. The record will remain open for two weeks. Thank well, you. thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairman, and we look forward to working closely with you as we move uh, forward uh, protecting uh, America's children and families. So thank you so very much for your participation. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with all of you, and I hope to, in the next few weeks, meet with uh, many of you individually. Thank you. For your personal questions. Thank you so very much. Uh, the committee is now adjourned.